Good morning. Welcome to Higher Rock Christian Church. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here with us this morning. And as we prepare our hearts to worship our God, to listen to His Word, let me direct you to a familiar verse, Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. In our consumer mindset culture, this verse is very controversial. The Christian life is described here not by what we get from God, but by how we fully and continually give to God. Even among Christian circles, the emphasis on the gospel has recently, for, for several years now, have had a dangerous side effect. No? Na may mga believers or professing believers that they believe that once I am saved and I believe in the gospel, I can relax. I can, you know, just basically keep receiving the rest of my life. But that is very... Uh, different from what we see in these verses that we read. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. This describes the believers as a holy priesthood where before in the Old Testament, we would have to present dead sacrifices, animals killed and slaughtered to represent our need for a savior as that Savior has arrived in Jesus Christ and we have received mercies from Him, we are now called to present our bodies in a new way as a living and holy sacrifice. So the picture here is as we are a holy priesthood putting ourselves on the altar, so it would seem, no? before God and pleasing Him in this way. Psalm 116 verse 12 says, For what shall I repay to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. But it does not stop there. I will pay my vows to the Lord. May it be in the presence of all his people. And so the true believer not only sees the grace and mercy of God, but responds to it in a way that is sacrificial, so that he may be lifted up. Over the years, as we grow in our Christian life, we may lose sight of this practice and this priority in our lives, that we are called every day to worship God, and that this worship does not simply entail emotions or songs or even traditions or devotions. Na parang, okay, pag nagawa ko na to, nakapag-worship na ako today. Rather, it is an entire life given continually, sometimes painfully, diba? and often with sacrifice. How do we get back on the altar? John MacArthur mentioned that uh, too often Christians find ourselves crawling out of the altar. <laughs> Ayo po natin na uh, ibigay yung buong bodies natin bilang uh, sacrifice and living and pleasing to God. And he says, it's in the same verse, we review the mercies of God. So we go back to the mercies of God. And again, recently, even in Christian um, circles, there has been an emphasis on the cross, but justification is not the only mercy of God. So even in Romans, from Romans 1 to kahit po sa hanggang chapter 8 lang, um, I tried listing over 30 different mercies. So let me give you some reminders of what are these mercies of God that we have received. We have received divine love. While we were sinners, God loved us. We have received peace with God. We have received power in the gospel. We see God's patience, his forbearance, his kindness. We also see that we will share in his glory and his honor. His righteousness is a mercy to us. Forgiveness and reconciliation is a mercy. Security by His Spirit, eternal life, freedom from the power of sin, resurrection, adoption, 
sonship, Christ's intercession. These are the multitude, but a taste of the multitude of the mercies of God. And we are reminded that the richer our grasp of our own salvation, the greater is our motivation to offer ourselves constantly as living sacrifices. Sometimes we think, do I desire? Is this still a desire for me to, to offer my body as a, a living sacrifice? And we are reminded in Hebrews 10 verse 21 to 22. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach him with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so as we come to the Lord in faith this morning, indeed, if we are truly His, He has given us a new heart that seeks after Him. Whether we might feel like it or not, our spirits long to know more of our Lord. And it will be a disservice to ourselves if we hinder ourselves from coming to worship to God. And so let us nourish our souls and lift up our bodies as living sacrifices. Let us rise. Father in heaven, thank you, O Lord, for the multitude of mercies you have shown us in Christ. And as we gather as your people, we remember and we desire to see, O Lord, our lives as living sacrifices on the altar of worship, pleasing unto you.
glorious light it is O oh Father that you have saved us through the blood of your son Jesus Christ death has no sting and life has no end what a precious promise for us and how sweet it is O oh Lord to be loved by the God of the universe and indeed O oh Lord what a small thing it is to repay you with our lives what a small thing it is, O oh Lord, to offer our lives as living sacrifices. And yet this is the logical response. It is only right that we should daily, moment by moment, offer our lives to you. And as that song says, we can never prove the delights of your love until all on the altar we lay. In the favor you show, the joy you bestow are for us who trust and obey. And as we worship you, O Lord, as we celebrate the salvation we have in you, won't you continue to fashion our hearts to be passionate, living sacrifices for you, worshiping you with all that we have and all that we are. to save faithful in love. 
save faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Glory be. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. The Lord is our salvation. Glory be, glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. strong to save and faithful in love. Thank you for reminding us, O Lord, that you are our salvation. No one can snatch that away. And yet, even our privilege to worship you cannot be compromised, Panginoon. Help us, O Lord, to remember that worship is not in word and singing only, but in a life that is offered constantly and continually in praise to you. Teach us today, O Lord. Be with us. And may we see your, the faithfulness of your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may now be seated. Good morning, Pa. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, I believe we have... Uh, First timer, first timers this morning. Pwede pong malaman, this is your first time perhaps to attend a gathering like this or your first time po sa aming church. Meron po ba? Meron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> first first time ako naka... Meron, alright. Praise the Lord. So, pwede, mo, pwede pong, uh, can we request them to please stand up? Ayan, meron po tayo dito. Ayan, praise God po. I think meron sa likod. O, okay na tayo. Ah, so, ito lang. Okay. So, meron lang tayong short uh, orientation po para po uh, ipakilala namin sa inyo in, uh, ang aming church. So, please follow Brother Vance. The one raising his hand at the back po. That's Brother Vance po. Nakareserve po ang, ang inyo pong uh, upuan. Okay, let's ask naman po yung mga children. Ah, dalawa pala. Sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay. Sige, can we ask now all the children para naman po sa mga ating uh, mag attend ng ating Sunday school this morning. We will pray for you before uh, sending you sa inyong mga classes. Okay, let's pray for them. Father, we uh, thank you, Lord, for um, uh, the love and for uh, the concern, Lord, para po sa mga bata na ito. Uh, thank you, Lord, by giving us a ministry that will nourish them, Lord, sa pag-aaral po ng uh, inyong salita. We place into your hands all the work we do and plan and prepare for them this morning. So please lead our teachers by your spirit to guide and care for each of them. And Lord, these children are all such treasured members ng aming pong mga church families. We know you have good plans and purposes, Lord, for their lives. So may the word that will be discussed be a seed that will be planted to a good soil 
a heart that is receptive. So help our teachers, Lord, that you guide and bless them as they teach. These are prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So uh, remember last week po, ginamit po natin ang uh, Psalm 103. Sabi po natin, uh, Psalm 103 is a pure praise from start to finish. It is, it is a psalm of eternal praise. It is a full uh, gospel praise. It is full of gospel truth. And it is a psalm only, sabi natin, for believers. So it begins and it ends with a personal call to worship. So let's read the first five verses po of Psalm 103. Verse one, verse 1 of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord my soul, and do not forget any of His benefits. Who pardons all your guilt, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with favor and compassion, who satisfy your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle. And as we have said po last week pertaining po sa intention ng psalmist na ito, this is how we are to live our lives, just like a fountain of praise. Just imagine po siguro relationships would be like in a marriage, uh, in a home, and in any other kind of situation. If we were constantly declaring the blessings of God, which are beyond our comprehension, and living in constant praise and worship to Him, so definite po siguro, we wouldn't have time for the nonsense of life. Now look at the second part of verse. The Lord asks that we remember all His benefits. He gives, he gives us po at least uh, a list to start with. Okay? Here are the benefits, verse 3. Who pardons all your iniquities. It's a po siyang remarkable statement, right? Who pardons all your iniquities. In the words of Isaiah po in chapter 43, He forgets them doesn't even remember them. So this is the first it, this is the first of God's gifts to the penitent sinner who has become a true worshiper. So this is salvation. This is the door to all of the treasure house of divine grace and mercy. This is the beginning. This is the first gospel statement. The gospel said that God forgives all our iniquities. Of course, that's a good news. It's not about a happy life. It's not about purpose. It's not about fixing our lives so that we can be more extremely fulfilled. It's not about giving us what we want. The good news is about the forgiveness of sin, by which you and I escape hell and enter heaven. That is where our thanks begin. I am forgiven. Today I am forgiven. I've been forgiven. I continue to be forgiven. We will keep on declaring God's forgiveness. And then the second part of verse 3, He heals all your diseases. Well, may mga nagkasabi po that it means physical diseases. Well, it doesn't. Because it's a parallel statement po to forgives, uh, forgives all your iniquities. So He does actually forgive all our iniquities. So whatever healing all your diseases means, it has to be as comprehensive as the forgiveness of our iniquities. And that cannot be referring to physical illnesses because all of us are in the process of dying and we've all got physical illnesses. What he's talking about here is healing our spiritual diseases, the diseases of the soul. Si Isaiah po, so chapter 1 in verse 5, sabi niya, Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The entire head is sick and the entire heart is faint from the sole of the foot even to the head. There is nothing healthy in it, only bruises, slashes, and raw wounds, not pressed out, nor bandaged, nor softened with oil. Dito po sa Isaiah referring to Israel, talking about their spiritual illnesses. And here the psalmist declares that the Lord forgives all our iniquities and He heals all the diseases of our soul. And one day, when we are glorified, he will heal all the diseases of our body when we receive a new body like Christ's resurrection body. What are the benefits again? Forgiveness, spiritual healing, which really describes regeneration, the making of new creature or the new birth. In verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit? 
He's talking about our salvation here, our redemption. But connected to our redemption is our resurrection, right? We will rise from the grave to be glorified, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 49, in verse 15, God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, or the grave. That's an, an, an amazing benefits. Forgiveness of sin, the healing of your spiritual diseases, the redemption of your life, that one day means you will be lifted up or back up out of the grave to eternal glory. And in the meantime, while we wait for that, verse 4 says, Bless the Lord who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. It's like a kind of coronation. He crowns us with His loving kindness. What is that? Committed love. It means covenant love. That's the kind of love that is unbroken, expressed in determined acts of the will of God by which He keeps His promise to those who belong to Him. Remember, He is a pardoning God. He is a forgiving God. He makes covenant with those who put their trust in Him. And He will never break that covenant. So we thank Him for His committed love, His unbroken love, His covenant love, and also His compassion. That is the action from that covenant love. Covenant love describes the relationship, and compassion describes the action of that relationship, the emotional side of God's favor. God not only loves us with committed love, but He loves us emotionally. He loves us so that He comes down and cares for us. He crowns us like royal sons and daughters with heavenly benefits, committed love. It's the promise of an unbroken love forever, and the fruit of that love is an act of compassion. Lastly, in verse 5, He also satisfies your years with good things. The sanctified, blessed life is the satisfied life. If you are walking with the Lord, if you have been saved, you walk in a way that God showers you endlessly with His heavenly blessings. This is the kind of imagery of an energetic, strong life, powerful life. And that's exactly what is promised by God to those who are His own. We need to be thanking Him for the forgiveness of our iniquities, for healing all our spiritual diseases, for redeeming us, for resurrecting us, resurrecting us from the grave, for crowning us lives, our lives with committed covenant love. And by that love, pouring out acts of compassion on us and satisfying us with every good thing, every good thing that pours life and strength into our spiritual lives. This is what it means to be blessed by God. And so in turn, we bless Him back. At this time, we can look for a partner. We can share our uh, personal concerns and prayer. And we can pray together, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Good morning. It's all right. Let's rise and worship. With one more song. Let's rise and sing this song. to my feet. 
feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will not forget your love for me and yet my heart forever is wandering. Jesus be my guide, hold me to your side and I will love you to the end, to the It is a great privilege to once again be gathered with your people, your body, this congregation for whom you paid the ultimate price on the cross of Calvary so that we might be redeemed and may stand before you unblemished as Adam and Eve were before they sinned. We thank you for your blood which accomplished this for each one of us. And as we turn to your word, once again we realize the great honor to turn to listen to you. We pray for your Holy Spirit to once again be our teacher and may our meditation be glorifying and honoring to you. We give you back all the praise and glory in Christ's name. You may all take your seats. Good day. I invite you once again to join me in our pulpit series based on the book of Matthew. James Tillis was an American heavyweight boxer in the 1980s. They called him Quick Tellis for his hand speed, which was quite astonishing for a man of his size and build. His claim to fame was being the first boxer to go the distance with Mike Tyson, who, as many of you know, had a habit of disposing his opponents in the first few rounds of the fight. Tillis was from Oklahoma, but he went to Chicago to pursue his heavyweight heavyweight title dreams. He went there full of excitement and hope. He related that on the day he arrived in Chicago, he put his suitcase down by his side, looked up at the 1,450-foot to Sears Tower, and said, Chicago, I'm going to conquer you. However, when he looked down again to the suitcase by his side, it was gone. <laughs> Whether true or not, the story is relatable. I mean, we set out with great hope, but discouragement is right by our side. The world works that way. Good and evil side by side. 
light and darkness side by side. And often we are all discouraged or afraid of the evil so near to us. We of course know that the scriptures tell us that the Lord Jesus has overcome evil. However, the Lord allows evil to remain in the world for a time. And so we must endure evil. We must endure discouragement and suffering alongside us. Now the presence of evil alongside good is tackled in the next parable we will take up today. If you will recall, two weeks ago, we came to the parables of Matthew 13 in our pulpit series based on Matthew's gospel. The parables in this chapter both give hope and explain disappointment. They reveal the kingdom is here, but only in part, that is, without its full might and glory. Jesus himself is the king, and though his kingly or uh, his kingship or lordship has yet to be realized in the fullest sense, his kingdom has come into the world because he himself has come into the world. But the great question is this. If the kingdom of heaven has indeed come, why is evil present? In fact, why does it seem that evil is stronger than ever? That was a very practical question for the disciples. After all, the kingdom of heaven had indeed come and had begun to spread upon the earth. Why was it that Jesus was meeting with such great opposition from Jewish religious leaders? Why were they plotting to kill him? Why was there so much resistance to the king, to, to Jesus Christ as king? But that truth is something that you and I may also ask. If it is true that Jesus' kingdom has begun on the earth, then why does it seem that evil has such a powerful sway over the hearts and lives of many? If the kingdom is here, why doesn't God do something about evil? If the kingdom is here, why does the cause of Christ struggles, struggle as much as it does? If the kingdom is here, why is sin and wickedness so prevalent and the gospel message so opposed? If the kingdom is here, why is it that e even as we speak, many of our brothers and sisters are brutally persecuted and put to death in various parts of the world? If the kingdom is here, why do churches, missions, and schools struggle to keep afloat? And with some even floundering. Like James Tillis, our hearts are filled with hope for the work of the gospel. That we would conquer our city as we spread the good news of salvation in Christ Jesus. But sin and evil confront us. And we wonder why things can't be smoother for the kingdom of God. I once spoke at a small church that run a school in the province. The building was completely run down and dilapidated. One hall in the building, must have been the top hall, had a ceiling that had a huge gaping hole in the, in the ceiling. I remember thinking that it looked like as if a meteor had fallen, had fallen through. The walls were discolored and pockmarked. Still, the congregation of that small church enthusiastically sang of the glories of the kingdom and received the word with much eagerness. At another place, I preached at a church that gathered, a church that gathered at an old house made, uh, a church gathered at an old house made mostly of wood. It seemed to me that the entire structure tilted on one side and could collapse any time like you know like the leaning tower of Pisa clearly that house had seen better days but in those places 
other false religions boasted of impressive church buildings where many adherents gathered. And so it goes. The work of God in those small and faithful churches is glorious, but their buildings desperately needed major makeovers or perhaps even to be torn down and replaced completely. But we do not despair. Yes, the kingdom often looks small, frail, and unimpressive. But in the end, it will bear an abundant harvest. For God's people, however, this is not always easy to accept. Remember, even John the Baptist stumbled over it. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He was aware that the Lord performed great miracles. But he expected more power. He expected a total defeat of the enemy who put him in dungeon and opposed the Lord. And when the Lord did not do what John expected, he doubted through his uh, he, he doubted and through his emissaries asked in Matthew 11 verse 4 which we took up some time ago are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? Like John the Baptist we too can struggle with a serious case of doubt especially when we expect the Lord to bless and move powerfully but does not. Well to prepare us for these disappointing scenarios, our Lord reveals that though the kingdom may start small and may even seem inconsequential, even with darkness and evil right by its side, in the end, it will reap a bountiful harvest and will emerge victorious. This is underscored in the second parable the Lord related in Matthew 13. Again, the topic is the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And so please open your Bibles with me to Matthew 13. And let's read from verses 24 to 30. From the NASB, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But his men were but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go gather them up? But he said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up but gather the wheat into my barn. I would like to divide today's study to three sections. The prob first, the problem we must endure, from verses 24 to 30. The promise we must look forward to, verses 36 to 43. And the principles we must learn. Now it is important to once again set the context of these parables in chapter 13. For if we do not know the background and reason for them being told, we will fall short of knowing what they truly mean. So recall first of all that the conflict between the Lord Jesus and the religious leaders has been escalating for some time. And now it has reached a peak with the scribes and the Pharisees falsely accusing Jesus of doing his various miracles by the power of Satan and with Jesus denouncing them for their hypocrisy. It is at this point that we see the Lord changing his method of teaching the multitudes. 
from his usual straight discourse, such as the Sermon on the Mount, to using parables. And as we have already learned, parables are supposed to bring additional understanding to a point being made by illustrating with an example from common life. But we have seen the Lord give the illustration without telling the people the point. Why? Well, as Jesus ex explained to his disciples, it was a means by which he could give to his followers an understanding about the mysteries of the kingdom of God while at the same time hiding that same knowledge from his enemies. And he explained this in verses 11 to 17. Jesus, Jesus' followers would be able to understand the parables because A, they would have the benefit of the Holy Spirit enlightening their minds and B, because Jesus would explain several parables to them in private. In the meantime, the Jesus' enemies would just become more confused because A, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God as the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2 and B, because they would try to understand what was said according to their already false understanding of the Old Testament. The purpose of these parables then is specifically to reveal some of the mysteries concerning the kingdom of God to Jesus' followers while confusing his enemies about those same mysteries. The Old Testament was not clear on many things that would happen to the future regarding the kingdom of God. And for this reason, the Lord said in verse 17 of the same chapter, For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. You see, the prophets in the Old Testament had operated under the point made in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever. So, the Lord's approval rating was plummeting and fast. It was becoming increasingly clear to the Jews that the kingdom of which Jesus spoke was not going to be anywhere near what they had been expecting. The picture of the Messiah in their minds was a conquering king who would not throw off the yoke of Rome but merely establish, but establish Israel as the center of the world which is an idea that they might have picked up from their readings in Ezekiel 36 verse 39. The Jews imagined the Messiah to be a man with a powerful sword and a great political authority. But to their dismay, the Lord was presenting instead a kingdom that would come through the simple act of proclaiming its message. That is, the word of the kingdom, as he says in verse 19. In addition, the Lord's parables signified that only a few would actually respond to the message and bear fruit. This is therefore, this therefore is radically different than the expected military kingdom that would force everyone to submit. So shortly after the Lord narrated the parable of the soils, or the parable of the sower, the Lord related another parable to them, as it says in verse 24. Them referred to the larger crowd. Even though the Lord had been explaining the parable of the soils, or the sower, to the disciples in the preceding section, the context makes it clear that, that them, the word them, in verse 24, is the Jewish crowd, which of course includes the disciples. So from a private time of explaining the first parable to the disciples, the Lord goes out and speaks the second parable to the larger crowd. 
And as we can see in the later verses, in verses 46 to 43, the Lord also provided a private explanation of the second parable to his disciples. And so we read in verses 36 to 43, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of God. And the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who, he who has ears to hear, he who has ears, let him ear, hear. So in verse 24, we are told that Jesus presented, or in some translations, put forth a parable to the people. The term presented or put forth means to place beside or to place near. It is the same word that is sometimes used in the Bible for the act of setting a meal before someone. It suggests the idea of deliberate and thoughtful care to give what is appropriate. In other words, Jesus tailor-made this parable for those who would hear it and set it before them for a blessing. The parable of the wheat and the tares is simple enough. To be sure, the sight of a man sowing seed in his field was familiar to all. The Lord said he that this man sowed good seed. This suggests that he was very careful to examine the seeds before he sowed them. He had a particular crop in mind. And in order to grow that particular crop, he was careful to select just the right seeds. The very best seeds. Good seeds that would take root and sprout up and produce a productive crop in his field. But we are told that something very evil happened. While the man and his servants slept, under the cover of night, an enemy crept into his field and sowed something else in the very places where the man sowed good seed. He sowed tares. Scholars tell us that uh, Darnell was a weed that was prevalent in, Palestine, in the Palestinian Syrian region and looks similar to wheat when it sprouted up. It even appears to have an ear that looked like an ear of, a wheat, of wheat as it developed. In fact, you cannot readily tell the difference until they had become ripe. But the tares were most definitely not wheat. They call it poison darnel. So when you put them side by side, and when they grow up together, people who are not in the know may just harvest them altogether. If the kernels from the tares end up being mixed with the kernels of wheat, the bread that would be made would make whoever ate it dizzy and a little sick. Therefore, the man who sowed the tares in the other man's field actually did something rather malicious. He was seeking to sabotage and destroy the other man's crop. It would put the other man in a terrible situation. And he could not allow the tares to be harvested carelessly with the wheat because that would cause the kernels to be mixed and would spoil the value of his crop. 
but he could not simply go out and pluck up the tares because by the time the tares and the wheat had grown to ripeness, their root system had become so intermingled together that you could not pull one out without destroying the other. Jesus tells us that the servants of the man were surprised to uh, were, were surprised at finding the tares. They were the ones that the man had hired to work and till his field and were most likely the first ones to notice these weeds. And they knew the meticulous care with which their boss had selected good seed. So they asked him, Sir, how did this happen? You planted good seed. How in the world did it come about that we see these tares? The owner of the field provides the answer. He says, an enemy has done this. The servants of the man then had an idea. Give us the word, sir, and you will go throughout the field and gather up the tares. But the master refused. No, he said, if you do that, you will uproot the wheat in the process. That will only make things worse. Instead, he told the servants basically to put up with the weeds for a little while. He instructed them to let both the weeds and the wheat grow together until the harvest. At that time, when the wheat was ripe unto harvest, he would send out his reapers into the harvest and tell them, make a distinction. Note the difference between the tares and the wheat. First, gather up the tares and separate them from the wheat. Bind up the tares into bundles and burn them in the fire. But having separated them from the wheat, gather up the wheat into my barn. The parable illustrates for us that we live in the midst of a problem. And it is a problem that the citizens of the kingdom of the Lord must endure for a time. The problem is that as the Lord's kingdom grows in the world, evil also grows with it. Thus, we may note or glean three things from this parable about evil alongside the kingdom. First of all, we note that evil is inevitable. In the Lord's explanation of the parable, he said in verse 37, the one who sows the good seeds is the son of man. So Jesus plants the seed. And in verse 38, we learn that the sons of the kingdom are the good seed and that the field is the world while the tares are sons of the evil one. The Lord clearly identified that the farmer who planted the good seed as the Son of Man, Christ Jesus. Son of Man is the Lord's common title for himself. It is a messianic reference. And so we see that the sower in the parable is the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is the Lord sowing seeds? In his field. And verse 38 tells us that the field is the world. The world is his field. It belongs to him. He is the sovereign king of the earth. It was he who made it. He holds in his hand the title deed over the world. Even though he has not really had uh, he, he has not laid claim to it fully as he will in Revelation 6 when Christ unrolls the scroll that's the title deed to the earth and take back the earth. It is, his, it is still the Lord's. It is His nonetheless. And according to Romans 8 all creation groans waiting for him to take possession of what is rightly his. God sows the children of his kingdom throughout the world. Believers are the sons of the kingdom, as we know. So the parable is a picture not of the world in the church, but the church 
in the world. We are placed within the world's system. This should remind us that we are not here by accident. We were planted by the Lord. And this should be encouraging. In the first place, He wants us in the world. That tells us that we are not to be out of the world. We are not to lock ourselves away in a monastery or a commune out in the mountains. And as we dwell in the world, the enemy, which is the devil, so stares among the wheat in the Lord's field. Thus, we need to realize that evil is not random. It is the work of the evil one. And as the Lord Jesus plants sons of the kingdom, the devil plants sons of the evil one. Now, verse 25 says, The enemy sowed weeds in the field while the men were sleeping. The sleeping men were not lazy. They were not negligent or irresponsible. They worked hard during the day and spent the night resting for the next day's work. And while they slept, the enemy sowed weeds in the field. Devoted Christians are weak people who need rest and sleep. But the enemy sows weeds in families, in neighborhoods, in schools, in workplaces, and government as Christians sleep. Satan tirelessly opposes the work of God. And whatever God and his servants are working, or wherever God and his servants are working, Satan and his, sa and his servants are also working. He not only actively takes away the good seed, like we saw in the first parable, but he also actively is planting bad seeds. He is raising up evil crops to infiltrate the church as pretenders in order to damage the good crops. A weed is a destructive force in a garden. It zaps nutrients and chokes out good plants. And weeds in the church are also destructive. The truth is weeds are a post-Eden fact of life. We must, however, remember, nothing good comes without opposition. Remember, too, that under the fire of persecution, the church flourished. Another thing we can glean from this parable about evil alongside the kingdom is that evil is subversive. Weeds grow inevitably and independently. But the enemy scheme to produce catastrophic effects on the harvest. He covered the field with tares. You know, sowing tares in another man's field was a common threat. That Roman law declared it a punishable crime. We might, we might say that it was a kind of like they probably saw this like a, an, the ancient bioterrorism. The devil has sought to spoil and destroy the growth and development of the kingdom of Jesus upon this earth. He has sowed tares, phony wheat, as it were, wheat like weeds in the very place where the good seed was sown by the Savior. So planting weeds where the Lord plants seeds is the subversive scheme of the enemy to stop God's kingdom agenda. And we see this in creation. God sowed children of the kingdom, Adam and Eve, and then came the enemy, and in the fall, he successfully sowed over the Lord's field. Satan is the wicked one. He is unmitigated darkness. And anybody 
who is not a child of God of the kingdom is a child of the wicked one. The truth is there are only two kinds of people in the world. Children of the kingdom and children of the wicked one. And if you are not a child of the king through submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ, then you are a child of the devil. It's that plain and simple. Thus, for example, in John 8, verse 44, the Lord said to those leaders of Israel, You are of your father, the devil. In 1 John 3, the apostle contrasts the children of God and the children of the devil. So, there are, those are the only two kinds there are. God is not the author of evil. Evil proceeds from Satan. He is the enemy who subverts the work of God. A third thing we can glean from this parable about evil alongside the kingdom is that evil is rest restricted. In the first parable, the parable of the soils or the sower, birds, rocks, and thorns endangered the seed. In this parable, notice that the seed is never in jeopardy, right? The weeds surrounded the growing grain. The weeds did not stop the growing grain. Yes, the enemy planted weeds, but he could not destroy the wheat. You see, pervasive evil cannot stop the kingdom of heaven. So if you are looking for the reason why there is evil mixed in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus in this world, then there is your answer. The fault is not with the kingdom, although that's the impression the devil wishes to convey. Rather, the fault is with the devil himself and his malice towards the king. Yes, good, good wheat can stand the test of the tares. But for the meantime, the malice of the devil is the problem that we must endure. And so, as, uh, and so long as we, who are of Christ's kingdom, are in this world, we must live with the fact that evil is also present. Now, the parable of the wheat and the tares does not only tell us of the problem we must endure, but also reveals the promise we must anticipate or look forward to. This is found in the Lord's own interpretation of His parable, particularly when our Lord speaks of the harvest. In verses, the second part of verse 39 up to 43, He said, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will, in, they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place where will, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears, let him hear. So our Lord identifies the harvest and the harvesters in the field or in this parable. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are the angels. Bear in mind that the Old Testament often uses the image of harvesters for the last judgment at the end of the age. This, this is something we see in Jeremiah 51 and Hosea chapter 6. Now, in the Lord's explanation of the parable, did you notice that the reapers are not the sons of the kingdom? Rather, the reapers or harvesters who are sent out authoritatively by the Lord Jesus himself 
to gather up the tares and separate them from the wheat are his angels. And they do the reaping at the harvest, which Jesus says is at the end of the age. This does not speak of the end of the world, but rather the end of the age in the history of the world. It speaks of a time of judgment at Jesus' return into the world. And our Lord described that time when he said in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 32, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the glorious throne, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And according to the Lord himself, once the harvest is in, the weeds will be recognized for what they are and thrown into the fire. There is mercy, but there is also justice. There is God who welcomes all true believers with open arms. And there is God who judges those who would not put their faith in Christ for the salvation of their souls. According to the parable, the harvest will happen. An abundance of wheat is gathered in, enough to make the landowner and the farmhands rejoice together. The seed was good, and it bore, through adversity, a fruitful harvest. We all know that in sports, leading at halftime does not win the game. The team that leads in the end wins. Yes, in the beginning of the parable, the enemy wins by sowing tears in the field. But that's just half time. The seeds grow despite the weeds. In spite of the weeds being sown. In the end, the landowner's harvest wins. The weeds are destroyed. The grain is harvested. And the enemy's plan is thwarted. Evil is real. But it is not ultimate. It never has the last word. We should not be surprised by the fact of evil. But neither should we despair. Our Lord lets us know that evil will be permitted by him to grow with his kingdom until the harvest at the end of the age. And then, and only then, will evil be removed, including all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. That time will be at the great angelic announcement made in Revelation 11 verse 15, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Yes, the devil is real and powerful, but defeated. God wins. God's harvest is unstoppable. God's kingdom will come. And so the parable ends on a note of brilliant triumph about the harvest. The righteous will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Hallelujah. There are a few practical lessons we can learn from this parable and from our Lord's explanation of it. First, I suggest that we understand that it is the Lord's plan that his kingdom citizen, citizens be sown into the world and bear his influence on it. You see, you see this from verse 24 when he said the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. And his explanation of the, this parable, he tells us 
In verse 38, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom and that the field is the world. Our Lord has chosen the, to leave the redeemed people to live in this world, the great field, to bring his influence upon it. Thus, before he went to the cross, he prayed for us. And said in John 17 verses 14 to 19, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For, they, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. That is the Lord's great plan for this lost world. To sanctify a people unto himself from out of the world and to send them back into the world to bring influence upon it. You remember, I am sure, of our Lord's great marching orders in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you have heard of the message of the gospel and have believed on Jesus Christ, you are the good seed that he has sown upon this earth. And I hope you are thrilled with a sense of greatness of your vital purpose. And I pray that you bear, the, as you bear the life-changing uh, message of Jesus Christ to the lost people of this world, and Jesus has left you here in this world for a time, I pray that you'll understand the great influence that you can have upon the work of God. You have great value. Be true to your calling, brothers and sisters. Now, a second principle we need to draw from this parable is a very sobering one. So long as the Lord Jesus' kingdom grows in this world, the devil will be sure that evil will be present. In verse 25 to 28, we see the fact that an enemy has come and has sown tares among the wheat and in the Lord's field. You and I need to realize that the devil has everything at stake in seeking to frustrate and destroy the kingdom program of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Lord's program succeeds, it will signal Satan's eternal doom. Thus, the devil seeks to sow his own wicked influence in the Lord's field, sometimes in the very places good seed was sown. We can get a good sense of the kind of evil that the devil seeks to plant next to the good seed by what Jesus says in regard to the day when he will send his reapers to remove and gather the tares. All stumbling blocks, meaning that which causes people to stumble in their faith, and those who commit lawlessness, meaning those who practice and advocate actions that violate God's standards of holiness in the law. All of this, all of them, shall, yes, grow alongside good seed, but judgment is coming. I think here of unbelieving and malicious people who, under the influence of the devil, seeks to cause professing believers to doubt their faith, or to persuade them to dabble in sin. Perhaps the advocate, perhaps the advocate 
uh, uh, perhaps they advocate some unbelieving philosophy or they promote the teaching of some cult and thus encourage disbelief or doubts. Perhaps they promote some liberation, some new liberation from God's standard and lead people into sinful disobedience. Whatever the nature of it, he warned in Matthew 18 verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be, thrown, and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. But for now, so long as the kingdom is being spread in this world, the devil will seek to sow tares where God sows wheat. Third, from this parable, we learn that as Jesus' as followers, it is not our role to remove that evil from the presence of the world. We see this in verses 28 to 29, where the servants of the owner of the field offered to gather up the tares, and the owner said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you might uproot the wheat with them. You see, the Lord left that important work to the reapers at the time of the harvest. And we are told in verse 39 that the reapers are the angels. The point is, angels are called to judgment. Christians are called to righteous influence. We are not called to judgment. We are not called to condemn the world. Now, we want to preach against the world's sins. We want to reprove its evils, but we must want to love its sinners and evildoers and be gracious and patient with them. We are not God's executioners. That is not our task. In the first place, we have an inadequate knowledge. We might end up making terrible mistakes as has been done so much in church history. But let us not obscure the fact that the Bible teaches that God is going to judge at the end of the age. And the angels are going to be the reapers. The gathering process of the elect and the gathering process of those to be judged is to be done by the angels. And we can see over and over again in the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation that God has called angels to reap. In Matthew 16, 27, we are told, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of His Father with His angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. And in Revelation chapter 14 and 19, we read that the angels are God's agents, agents of judgment, not men. So we wait until the king comes back with his angels to make these things come to pass. Thus, Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 1, the second part of verse 7 all the way to verse 8, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution for those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. When is that going to happen? Well, that day will be when, we, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints. And He will come with His holy angels. I have a feeling it's going to come on February 29. No, I'm just kidding. So this parable speaks of a day of judgment. On that day, the tares will be gathered up and burned. And verse 41 explains, The Son of Man will send forth His angels. They shall gather out of, the king, of His kingdom. The kingdom here is the whole world. It is in His entire field, as we already said. And He gathers them all in together like unclean animals and clean in the same ark, like goats in the same pasture with sheep, like bad fish in the same net with good fish, 
like chaff on the same floor as the grain, like vessels to dishonor in the same house as vessels of to honor. He gathers them all and then pulls out of his kingdom those that offend him and anything that is sinful and unbelieving of that anything that is sinful. And we must remember that unbelief offends the Lord Jesus. They shall then be thrown into the furnace of fire, which is an image of the most horrible death and eternal hell. In scripture, we read about chaff being burned. We read about branches being burned. Even in the Old Testament, we read of trees being burned. And here in this parable, we see the darnels being burned. The idea is that the ungodly will be consumed in fire. It is pictured as the lake of fire in Revelation 19. It is pictured as the unquenchable fire in Mark chapter 9. And it is pictured as the everlasting fire in Matthew 25. It speaks of the terrible and everlasting doom of the unrighteous, the sons of Satan. Now, I hasten to add that an important part of our duty in this world is to serve as salt and light. This was part of our Lord's sermon, if you will recall, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. And there he calls us to, to, he, he calls us to let our light so shine in this world that men, will, uh, th that men will see our good works and glorify our Father. Moreover, he calls us to serve as preservatives in this world so that we will keep the corruption of sin from overwhelming everything around it. And when it comes to the church itself, it is our duty to lovingly confront sin in our midst and call an erring brother or sister to repentance as we read in Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Remember, Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 verse 11 to have no fellowship with the unfruitful work of darkness, but rather expose them. If we are with, let us influence the world for good and for God. Our attitude should be one of love rather than one of condemnation. You know, it is easy to sit back and condemn sinners and speak evil of them and blast away at them because they have, because we have cause because of their sin. But somehow in the process, we begin to want to call down judgment on them. Maybe we need to ask God to give us greater grace towards these people. The same grace that he had towards us. Without a doubt, evil will always be present in the world and it is not our task to remove it. It is not our job to make heaven on earth, nor is it in our ability to do so. A fourth lesson that we can pick up is that we are to patiently persevere in faith and obedience until the day that Jesus himself orders the complete removal of all evil from the presence of the world. Persevere until that day. In verse 30, the owner of the field told his servants to let both tares and wheat grow together until the harvest. At the time of the harvest, the landowner would send out his reapers to take care of things. But until that time, it was the duty of the servants to continue doing their job. We are therefore to keep about our business, persevere in our faith, remain obedient to His call, and live as salt and light in this world. Let us not forget that in this parable, the Lord tells us that His work will typically start small, but will finally bear an abundant harvest. So let's not lose heart over small beginnings. Let us not fall into the trap of desiring rapid achievement, but rather accept 
the gradual incremental growth of God's work. At the end of this parable, the Lord attached a solemn warning. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This warning tells us that if a man or woman is not one of the sons of the kingdom, then they are among the tares who will be gathered by the angels on the day of judgment at the end of the age and will be cast into the furnace of fire where there will be eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some people don't care if they go to hell because they perceive hell to just be a place where, they're, where their friends will be and that they will just party, wild, have wild parties for eternity. Well, it's not going to be that way. Right here, Jesus said in hell, every citizen there, every occupant there will experience weeping and gnashing of teeth for all eternity. The Lord Jesus is showing great mercy in speaking these words now so that we may hear Him and turn to Him for salvation. May, may this be a time of searching. May this be a time of reflection. May this be a time that you may truly repent and believe in Jesus as your Savior. And may those of us who have already come to saving faith because you see the mark of grace, because you see a growing obedience in your life, you see that you are no longer, you no longer make a practice of sinning, I pray that this message will give you tremendous assurance and encourage you to faithfully proclaim this saving message until the day of our Lord's coming. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, we thank you for this parable. We thank you for allowing us once again to understand why evil exists in the world, even if your kingdom has already come. But we look to the day, Father, when, the, when evil will be completely pulled out of this world, even as you reign completely all over the earth. We look for the, to that day when you and your angels will reap the good, uh, the wheat, and store them in your barns. Thank you, dear God, that we have this to look forward to. And we pray for each believer that we might be found faithful to that very end, to the very end. We pray, however, for those who are here. Maybe this is the first time they've heard the gospel. Maybe they have not yet come to saving faith. And I pray, dear God, whoever they are, whatever their situation, I pray that you will allow what they heard this morning to grow in their hearts. May they come to a realization that whatever their religion, whatever their good works, this will all be filthy rags before our righteous and holy God. So I pray that they might come to saving faith. Thank you, dear Father, for our time together. Thank you for allowing your church to once again gather in worship. As we uh, open this week, we trust that you, your grace will abound. Bless every family and family represented here. Bless, Lord, each one uh, in the work that we will have to do. Whatever our endeavors, dear Lord, give us success. We give you praise and thanks for your kindness. All glory belongs to you. In Christ's name. Amen. We have uh, three first-timers who went for orientation and we'd like to call them to stand up if they're still here. Marianika Borla, Samantha C., Rose Neal Lasala. Uh, if you are still here, my, uh, thank, you for, thank you for coming. You certainly are most welcome in our congregation and we pray that uh, the Lord will bless you throughout the week. And we pray that we will still see you maybe next week. We only have two announcements for today. The comfort and conviction of God's presence, which is the last installment of the series this coming Wednesday. 
This is our midweek prayer service theme. Again, we invite you to join us with, uh, in our prayer service from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. via Zoom. And if you have prayer concerns, uh, you can write them down on pieces of paper and drop them in the prayer boxes or email them at hrcc.payforme at gmail.com or you can send an SMS to 0917-889-0521. And the second announcement is in regard to the Daily Vacation Bible School, make a joyful noise. So if you have children from ages 3 to 12, you are invited to bring your children uh, from uh, on July 4 to 8, Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 11.30 for the DVBS entitled Make a Joyful Noise. That's all we have by way of announcement, so please rise and let's sing our final song. Strength subdue, 
evil tempers, words untrue, thoughts impure and deeds unkind, all things hateful to thy mind, then we truthfully can sing, we are children of the King, children of the King are we. Truthfully can sing, we are children of the King. Children of the King are we. May we loyal to Him be. Live to please Him every day, worship Him in every way, so we truthfully can sing. So we truthfully can sing. Yes, we truthfully can sing. We are children of the King. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet. Or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do. Where He sends we will go. Never fear, only trust. To trust and obey, trust and obey, to be happy in Jesus. Indeed, O oh Lord, evil may abound, but we trust in you, and we look forward to the day when you will harvest our souls, O oh Lord, you will bring us to your presence, O oh Lord, even as you judge the earth. May your name be glorified. May you be lifted up in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And amen. Morning, Pop.